I'm Matt Deloy, I'm an artist, mostly working with code, generative systems, anything computer related. I'm Tom, the founder of Make Ready, a fine art printer based here in North London. We're here today to discuss Sierra, a print that we've made in collaboration with Matt. It brings together the idea of systems within color and systems within printing. Before we get into how the print is made, for those that don't know about generative art and your practice, um, can you give some insight into actually how you created this source image? So generative art is a type of computer art where basically you create an algorithm or you create a set of instructions, usually using code. And then when you run that, it'll produce typically an image or an output. And each time you run it, you'll typically get a different output. So I can run a program a thousand times, get a thousand different outputs or even more than that. Uh, and often the process involves a lot of curation. You have to run these systems over and over again and look at many, many thousands of outputs to find the gems and iterate on your code each time you're doing that to maybe tweak some parameters or make it a little bit better each time. Uh, and Sierra, this print, it's really one of the gems that I found after thousands of outputs and I haven't found any others that are like this one. And so I decided Instead of making this a series of different works, it's best to just focus on a single print. And this, the screen printing process kind of works beautifully for this. Yeah, I think like what you're saying about like iterating mm -hmm. it, it is so similar to the silkscreen process because you know ultimately we are working with one image at a time, and silkscreen printing you know can be very repetitive. But um, you know as you're setting up and making ready the process and actually setting up the bench, you're constantly adjusting the registration and iterating the settings to really, really nail almost the focus of the image. So although it's not exactly the same, I guess there's some parallels there. It's a complete, ours is a complete analog process, but um, you know, we are, you know, going through, you know, ultimately over the year, thousands of prints, you know, there's all, all, all you know, for the thousands of prints that we make, there's many more that we don't even show because they're slightly wrong and we're not quite happy with it. So we, we do the same thing um, for each job that we work on, each project that we work on, you know, we, we, we iterate the whole process throughout. The screen printing process is fascinating to me because it's somewhat similar to sometimes what I can do with my code where I say, okay, I want this ink and I want this ink to fill the page mm. and then I want this ink to fill these particular pixels or these particular strokes. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, there's some parallels there. So it's really interesting to try and bring some of my code into this format for this print. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, some of the things that we were looking at earlier, like the actual, I think even you were surprised by the prerequisite parts of the image um you know we the way we're sending the print up is you know we don't just see the image and then it just evolves in front of us you know or, or like a, how we might a painter might like you know paint an image and, and have the raw vision of it it is very much about a set of inputs that we define on the press the settings the inks and it's you know knowing what the outputs are going to be but you can't really control that process it is kind of doing it for you so i guess it is it is really similar in that in that sense conceptually because um you know you you can only touch the settings at the beginning and then it is always so surprising um and so curatorial how you end up looking at it you know and we're always surprised by the work that we make to be honest i think you're saying screen printing is, is fascinating like i've made so many prints now for so many artists every time i lift the screen up like, i can't believe it's works yeah i can imagine perhaps it's the same for you in that the unadulterated joy of seeing an artwork come to life. In a way, there's like a mechanized process to both screen printing yes. and a lot of generative work where, yeah, it's a set of systems, a set of inputs. And once you let it run, it just kind of goes on its own. And then the final output is just kind of like revealed to you. Yeah. And you, you end up looking at it and being like, oh, I got to do this again with this one little thing tweaked. Uh -huh. And then you have to restart from the beginning. So there's Definitely. kind of the same workflow in some ways. Definitely, so definitely. Yeah. So when you're creating an output like this, you know, you said there's quite a significant amount of time that you have to wait. Now, how long were you waiting to sort of see this image really? And, and, and what was it about this image particularly that stood out for you from the, from the thousands of others that you, you can generate? Yeah, this is kind of an interesting situation where I was working with my code and quite often the way I work is I'll take existing libraries that I've done in the past and I'll tweak them slightly and I'll you know, iterate on them very in small incremental parts, basically. Uh, and I was looking at my code and I just saw this one output and I thought, this is really nice. There's something really special about this. 
but I'm sure the code is going to produce lots more like this. So I'm just going to park this and come back to it and keep running the code, uh, keep running my software and keep, you know, iterating on this. And no matter what, it would never produce that one t type of work again. It's just, there was something about this one work that really evoked this kind of like lonely mountain or like alpine glow or some sort of some sort of warmth that I couldn't really see in any of the other outputs. And so it was really this like magical moment where all of the dimensions of the artwork just happened to sort of coincide together to produce this particular this particular work. And so yeah, it took a, a while, but at the same time it was it was one of uh it was just one of the images that stood out and even after trying, I couldn't find one that was uh, anywhere near like this one. Yeah. I guess that's what it is to be an artist, right? Is to, you know, see something and have that emotional connection with it. And, you know, it's inexplicable why it's a strong image, but, you know, you just know it is. And, and that's what makes your work so special. Yeah. You know, I know people like Francis Bacon certainly spoke about that, that initial mark that could never be replicated, you know, and just does something to you. So it's really cool to see that in the digital space, there is that same artistic streak when you're going through you know i mean thousands of images you know how how do you go through them like you know must take you know some time to do that as well you know yeah typically what i'll do is i'll have uh i'll write software so that i can just have it running you know as i'm making lunch or just out and about and then i'll come back and i'll have to sort of sift through it's almost like you're sifting for gold or something and you're just looking at thousands of outputs and quite often you'll see one that's like this is kind of interesting. And so I'm gonna tweak one part of my code to sort of steer towards this direction. And then I'm gonna restart the process, generate another thousand and just keep doing that. And there's this real element of surprise that you get from generative art where you kind of know what you're after. You have a rough idea, but quite often the, the code or the, the software, it gives you a different idea than what you were thinking would happen. And then you end up saying, well, this is actually kind of interesting. I'm going to go down this rabbit hole. And so it's this kind of almost like collaboration with you and the, the software where, you know, you have some inputs, but then it spits some things back out at you. Sometimes it's a bug. Sometimes it's like a, just a glitch. And sometimes it's like this kind of serendipity where the dimensions line up very nicely and you can't really predict that. So it's cool that that serendipity pervades throughout the work that yourself as an artist are surprised. I think there is something about being an artist and certainly a lot of the ones that I've worked with and the best, most successful prints that we've made is often that we create something where it's not what the artist ever really thought or we ever thought would really happen. And, and therefore it, it is total original, you know, do you think the print is as you expected it? I mean, what were your kind of expectations going into our collaboration and, you know, we, you know, we equally are surprised by, by the outcome that we produce. Yeah, it's interesting. When I started this collaboration, I had a sort of idea of how I thought the print will look at the end. And in the end, it hasn't really gone like that. It's been this kind of surprise where the the process has sort of influenced how we go. So some elements of the screen printing might work better or worse with uh, with the code that I had written. And so I had to kind of go back to my code and prepare it a little bit differently for the particular screen print process. And in the end, actually, there was a few things that changed where it really kind of delightfully surprised me with, for example, the uh, the fluoro layers. We didn't really go into this project thinking we were going to be putting fluoro ink on a print. And in the end, it's kind of got this like nice sheen, this nice kind of, you know, very subtle effect, but it adds this kind of dynamic richness to it that you wouldn't get without this fluoro layer. So it's elements like that where I just had no concept going into the project that I'd be, you know, accepting those things. Originally, I probably would have been like, no, I don't want it to be yeah. fluorescent. But, you know, now seeing it, it's like, yeah, this is this is way better. Absolutely. I think that's the best thing about collaborating with a printmaker, mm -hmm. especially in screen printing, because when you, people think about screen printing, they think Warhol, Rauschenberg, like solid block color, right? But actually the way, like the fluoro that you picked out particularly, and I've shown you the separations of the way it is, it's not this solid area, it's this weave into the print, you know, it, it, it adds its fluorescence, its day glow to the red and to the yellow. And, you know, and that's, that's great because, you know, actually you're totally right. And we've had that a lot before where we, we sort of suggest an idea and someone has a concept of that in their head 
and in a printed reality. And I really like that phrase because when you collapse an idea, it's just a probability at one time and then it collapses into reality and you really see it. Often um, people are going to be quite, you know, against an idea. Actually, you know, suddenly go, oh my God, I love, I love that. Even something like the, uh, the gloss versus the matte. Like typically I would want to go with a matte print because somehow it just, it feels more like the, the system that I'm trying to create with my code. But in this case, the gloss actually allowed it to like elevate in different ways. So the different colors and different layers would feel almost like you were saying at one point, like a woodcut or something like that. And it just, in the end, it's like, yeah, this is the way to go. And it's different than what I would have originally thought. Yeah. But I remember actually prepping for the meeting for you coming in and we were like, oh, you know, what's it in matte? And I think you should do it in gloss. And I think it was within two seconds you saw the gloss one. Yeah. And you were like, it's that, yeah, it's, you know, it's the one. And, I, and I said it as well, you know, I think you should do this. And yeah. you're right, it does look like a wood cup. You know, it has those intensely thick buildups of, you know, 100% ink density over 100% ink density that um, is like no other process. You know, it, it does feel so original in that sense and the way that it's produced, absolutely. So I'm really glad, you know, I love gloss. <laughs> so I'm glad you went for it. It looks, it looks amazing. So I guess what's interesting about this print and what's challenging about it is that we've taken an image that is, you know, a digital image that is generally viewed on a graphics display monitor in RGB. And then we translated it into a print, you know, with real ink reflected light on the surface, what we would call subtractive color mixing with cyan, magenta, yellow, and black CMYK inks. Um, you know, it's not necessarily a match, it's an accompaniment to the original, um, which I guess is quite fascinating concept really because color is a huge subject um is there anything about the translation that we've made into a physical object that fascinates you most yeah one of the things with this project is going from my code into this physical medium is uh is quite an interesting process in its own because the code is spitting out these rgb colors and a lot of what we had to do is this kind of iterative process of how do we get this image that's digital and that's like screen based and display based into uh, a physical print and you can't just you know push a button to convert to cmyk it actually like you were saying has to be these different layers that are kind of pushed onto each other and in that process you lose some information and it kind of changes the way it looks and so it was this real like back and forth of how do we even do something like the background color mm. and you ended up flooding it with a single color first and then printing the rest of the colors on top. And so part of that was like my code had to be able to support, you know, this kind of use case. So it was this real interesting iterative process of how do we even get it into this CMYK space that's not just a simple conversion because, you know, we could do a simple conversion, but there's probably something better we can do rather than just, you know, a straight conversion. We actually look at the image, we look at the artwork, we look at the code, and we see what can be done. So yeah, it was an interesting process. And I, I think we could probably go deep into like color theory, color space, color like. Yeah, I think that's a, yeah. The conversion point actually is is really important because, um, you know, color conversion is a massive subject. You know, if the printers watch this, you know, I'm sure everyone will have their two cents on it. But you know, you're right, you can do a simple conversion, you can go to Photoshop and you know, when you can convert in that way, and you can pick a color space that, you know, is maybe wrong for our process. And because of the way that we're set up here, you know, we have ran many target tests. We've fingerprinted the presses. We really know what we can achieve in the achievable color gamut or the color range, if you will, of the, uh, of the colors and the inks that we have within our CMYK set. We'll get a bit deeper into how we actually produce the print with that. Um, but we actually sent you our color profile, didn't we? Uh, which was pretty cool. So, it, it, you know, right from the get-go, there was this dialogue between us, if you will, where we were talking color, you know, we we're saying, well, this is the color range that we can achieve it in. So when you convert it, we're not gonna get any color cast or loss of detail, essentially, where colors are snapped off and compressed from, you know, even if it's an sRGB or Adobe 1998 RGB, these are, you know, relatively large color spaces relative to, a CMYK color space like we use, which is a you know a, a European color initiative color space, um, but you know the reds and the blues and the purples and greens. I mean they're very difficult to reproduce as an intermixed color, 
um, you know, we, we really thought about that. And I thought that was, that was really exciting as a printmaker because um, it's not often we send someone our color profile and they really listen to us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The funny thing about that actually was like, this is a bit of a side tangent, but you send me that color profile and I have a Python script that kind of does what Photoshop does where it splits the image using a particular color profile into these CMYK layers. It's not quite as advanced as what you guys have set up with like 12 layers or 20 layers or whatever, but it's what I'm using to automate the process of how is this going to look as CMYK, but how is it also going to look as combinations of CM and magenta and yellow together? And then because this is another part of this project that's kind of interesting is the, the digital component of this project is taking this uh, single image, uh, deconstructing it into the CMYK plates, and each of those plates is just like a black and white bitmap, like a mask. One. Kind of, yeah, one bit mask, just like you would use with screen printing when you have an acetate sheet and you print on that acetate sheet. So it's been this kind of dialogue that has shaped the project as well. Because I think if it wasn't for screen printing, I wouldn't be exploring this concept of four different plates and CMYK and things like that within the project itself. So it's been this really interesting, yeah conversation yeah yeah Yeah. and what's exciting about the process is not only is it split into four plates or screens or channels actually at the at the digital pre-press stage of the channels um is that then there when we do it and our really unique process is that we split it again into three more per channel to achieve that wide tonal range you know because we can't necessarily produce all zero to two five five you know in this this one bit of each channel uh uh, sorry um, each channel is obviously one bit you know, we can't produce all of that. So we split it again and this available toning range that we can achieve on the actual mesh then achieves that together. So the actual color management workflow is a vast, you know, it's actually pretty complex how it gets all the way to the end. And we're obviously making it very effortless, but um, there is a dialogue. You're right. Yeah, that's absolutely the right way of putting it. Um, we haven't even gotten into like dithering and like diffusion. So that was the other thing that I yeah. kind of, I noticed with this project is we initially had a, an artwork that was made up of small little strokes of color, which is kind of a theme I've been working with quite often is instead of using pixel-based work or instead of using raster-based work, I work with like vector strokes kind of inspired by like pen plotters from like 1960s era computer computer art. But uh, this particular work, it was originally these small strokes of color. And when we applied it to the screen printing process, I think potentially because of these different screens having to be half tone and like bitmap, it ended up creating this kind of crunchy texture that I don't think we really liked. And so I had to kind of go back to the code, change that density, change that to to fit the the half tone pattern, I guess, that comes out. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, you're right. It is a half tone, you know, it's a frequency modulated half tone, which is what was really important about the work, I think, because you're right, it does have this scratchiness or, or it maybe had it before. And, uh, you know, when, when we kind of, it was great that you could go back and edit it and, and I give us, you know, give us something that you were really pleased with because it is fascinating how it's actually made, you know, each, you're right, it's a one bit um, file of each separation. It then goes into our raster image process, our RIP software. And you say dither, actually, it's it's similar to a dither. You know, some people who use Photoshop might be familiar with the diffusion dither, right? But dither is actually a slightly different way of producing the image. Ours is a true stochastic screen. You know, when we say screen, it's very confusing. We don't mean a computer screen or we mean a screen as in screen printing. We mean it's screening the image in a paginated way and basically assigning a value of how many dots there are to that value, right? And it's frequency modulated. So every dot is in a seemingly random place, right? Its frequency is modulated, but every dot is the same size. So its amplitude is the same. So that's why it's different to when you see a newspaper and you, you know, you see the dot in there, that classic sort of Warhol, Rauschenberg dot, right? That's an amplitude modulated half tone. So all the dots are different sizes, depending on what the information is. If there's a high density area, there'll be larger dots. If there's not much information in the highlights, there'll be smaller dots. But their frequency is always the same. And that's where you get the lines per inch from. I think you asked me a question earlier yeah. about angles. You know, with frequency modulated, we don't need the angles. There are no angles. It's all the same. You know, it's just the frequency of the same size dot is modulated. And that's how we create that kind of almost like haze, you know, and, and then the, as they print on top of each other, 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 you get this smooth, and it is quite smooth in a way, you know, and that's where the smoothness comes from. And, and that is inherently digital pre-press. And that's been around for a long time. We're standing on a hundred years of history there, you know, 
people would have done it with plates and film, you know, literally exposing screens in that way before we came along. But I think we're born in the right era because it's yeah. a bit simpler now, but um, it's fascinating to talk about it because, you know, there is inherently some very complicated code that is in the program that we use that describes the image to the, to the printer and drives the printer uh, that produces the acetates before we even get to the analog part. So, you know, screen printing is inherently quite a fascinating digital process in that sense. What's behind the, the cream background and kind of how, you know, how we got there together, because it's quite an interesting story of, you know, a few iterations of, of proofing, basically. Yeah, I mean, the original outputs from my code had this kind of off-white, creamy colored background, and it's something I, I tend to use actually quite a bit in a lot of my generative work. I feel it just gives it this warmth and almost like, in a way, a parchment, I guess, but just something that feels a bit more natural rather than this cold, pure, brilliant white. And when we went into this screen printing process, you know, we, we tried with just a, a white background, as in no background, just allow the paper to shine through because that's the, the natural element. And it was just a bit too cold on the white paper we were using. You know, we could have gone with maybe a creamy colored paper, but in some ways, you know, your system is set up for these papers. You, you know these papers work really well with your process. And we thought, why don't we just, well, this was your idea, was why don't we just flood fill with this single color and then apply the rest of the artwork on top. So this is kind of something that's unique to this screen printing process is you can really just choose to, you know, flood fill the page and then print the rest of the color layers on top. And it just adds more ink onto the page to sort of lift everything off. And it was this kind of interesting idea that I would not have thought about was to to actually flood fill with the background color first. But, you know, it's very much like how you write the code. You know, when I write my code, I flood the page with beige and then I apply my layers on top afterwards. Uh, so it's kind of this nice parody there. Yeah. And it's really cool that, you, yeah, you wouldn't have thought of that, right? But actually maybe the answer was right under you the whole time because yeah. you were doing it, right? And I think that's the best thing about screen printing is that it is the best way to apply a surface coating to a substrate, right? Be that glass, perspex, paper. We're always thinking in that way. You know, we, we have it before where people come to certain papers and coating the entire paper with a solvent or UV ink and it won't cockle or change or or deform in any way, you know, it'll just give this really nice surface. And I think it actually gives not only a great color to the background, ultimately it changes the transparent ink sitting on top of it. Um, it's really cool because it also gives a slight elevation to the gloss as well, you know the dot will inherently sit very differently on a coated paper because it's coated now, semi-coated. Um, and that's what makes it so unique. It's not like the other prints we make because we don't often do that, you know. Um, so it's nice again to have that dialogue between those two processes, you know. Um, you know, and the, and the scratchy texture that you were talking about before, you know, we went through an iteration where we'd proof something and then, and then you changed it, you know. Can you elaborate on, you know, what was it about that you didn't quite like and you know and how how did you go about changing that and coming to that conclusion yeah there's something with uh a lot of the code that i write and a lot of the, the systems that i work with i really like this kind of texture and grain that you get from imperfections and quite often it's something as simple as like a gaussian distribution of random noise or something that i add to every little pixel or every little stroke of color just to sort of make it so that it's not a perfect uniform texture but it's something a little bit grainy almost like film grain that you see in like a analog photography and so I tend to really amplify that in my digital work but interestingly when it came to actually printing this that amplification that was sort of designed for screen or designed for digital process it didn't really look that good in uh, physical format it just kind of looked a bit crunchy it looked a bit too intentional and you could really see this kind of uh yeah, crisp crunchiness that didn't really lend itself well to this warm, soft uh, feeling of the print. And so in the end, what we did was uh, I went back to the code and increased the density of the strokes, basically, so that instead of there being, you know, 100,000 strokes or 200,000 strokes, there's like 10 times or 100 times more strokes, which took, you know, maybe an extra five minutes to render an artwork, which is quite a long time in my my world. <laughs> Um, but uh, just because I'm dealing with usually thousands of outputs, but uh, that extra five minutes to render this particular print, it allowed it to be almost like a raster image, but still with some small grain, which is uh, the 
underlying transparency of the area that's not inked, basically. And so in the end, this this process, I think what it ended up looking like now is that it still has this little little bit of texture. It's not like a perfect raster-based image. If I was using something like shaders or if I was using something else like a you know Blender or Cinema 4D or something like that, you'd get this like kind of perfect smooth raster rendering. Whereas with the code and with the system I've got, it's this more textured stroke-based thing that I think still kind of, you can see a little bit in the print and it just creates this nice little texture that's not too accentuated. Yeah, it's like film grain. It's like there's something really nice about it. I, I completely agree. Like you could look at it and think, yeah, you know what? This could be really smooth. Like, like Again, like we mentioned a woodblock earlier, it could be something really like that. But seeing about woodblock or some sort of process like that is that there is an imperfection in a way, you know, and it's quite interesting that, you, you know, I didn't realize that, that you can kind of go back and then you added more dots, more kind of dots, let's say, per, or uh, items per given centimeter or whatever. And we actually do the same thing, well, effectively, and I'm speaking my language here, but we actually do the same thing with us. So if we're printing a certain print with a frequency modulated half tone, you know, we can have a 52 micron dot or a 100 micron dot, you know, and, and actually we can pack way more information into a smaller given area and kind of hide that. You know, whereas we've made prints for an artist, a photographer, where they want to see the dot. It's actually it needs to be big. It needs to be part of the artwork. So we, in a way, we can go back to our own drawing board uh, and change the size of the inherent, you know, particle, if you will, that defines, builds the image. So there's so many similarities, actually, in such an analog and such a digital world. We've obviously been drilling into a lot of detail about this particular print, but how does Sierra fit into the whole body of, you know, all of your work? Yeah, in some ways, it's kind of a continuation. Um, a lot of the projects that I've been exploring in the last few years have been somehow you know, terrain-based or geologically based or you know, in some ways based on, you know, loosely the environment. Um, but, uh, but Sierra is, I guess, more directly comparable to Meridian in some ways because it is this kind of almost like a mountain uh, mountainscape and some of the rendering systems are inspired by uh, some of the ways that Meridian works as well. So in some ways it's a continuation, but it's also kind of exploring new avenues. Um, no longer trying to do long form, uh, at least not in this particular project, not trying to make it a serial artwork, not trying to make it a algorithmic work that's constantly changing or interactive or anything like that, but really just focusing on how can I create a physical print from my process in a way that really lends itself well to screen printing because like we're talking about there's so many interesting parallels between screen printing and some of the processes around generative art and coding that i think there's a lot of interesting areas to play with there um and there's a lot that i would like to continue to explore like there's so much even just seeing the acetate sheets behind me i'm like god it would be cool to like mm. just you know print different layers with my code on acetate and see what we can be doing with like making gradients with inks and things like that. Like there's, there's a lot of fun that can be had from this kind of process. Yeah. It's almost like a Polaroid in time, isn't it? It's like a Polaroid snapshot. Uh, like I said, a sort of collapsed reality version of something in the physical world. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's what's quite cool about it for me as someone who works, you know, obviously I really like, you know, the digital work. Uh, and generative work, but it's, uh, you know, my heart lies with physical, you know, because that's what I do every day. And um, it's such a great marriage. And for me, it's an amazing way to sort of, you know, explore your work. I think there's a lot of uh, this idea of process, this idea of like craft and this idea of kind of working through a set of, you know, systems or a set of instructions to get this final output that I'm really interested in with my generative systems. And it's something that also draws me into this world of screen printing. So like even a few years ago, I was learning about screen printing and not, not to the extent that you're doing here, uh, of course, but uh, it's this process that really fascinates me. And it feels in some ways like there's a lot I can learn in once I start to go down this path of screen printing and learning about screen printing and having these conversations, I go back to my code and my code ends up being kind of changed and shifted and inspired by some of the processes. Like you're talking about frequency modulation, you're talking about all these things and I'm already, my head is spinning like, would it be interesting to do a project around these kind of dots and around this frequency mod modulation. So yeah, it's it's a nice uh, nice collaboration. Yeah, I guess when you get to the heart of it, really it's signal processing because FM and AM is 
the way radios work, right? You know, it's the way you process a signal. It doesn't matter what that signal is, you know. So there's inherently they are, you know, they are tied together in some way. It's just our signal has a different out. You know? Yeah, so it's a really fascinating subject. Yeah, even when you talk about signal processing, it's like it's kind of what a lot of generative art is, where you have a noise terrain and it's just a signal, and you're processing the signal and you're adding randomness, but the randomness is also a signal, so it's all just signal processing. We have the same thing with the frequency modulated half tone, where um, you can have a first and second order stochastic screening. So you know, if you want to have certain parts of your highlights that uh, don't cave in or a bit more subtle, you can have a second order stochastic screening. You know, so it's you know, it, it is it is an amazing. Some of the tools we have are essentially signal processors. That's really what they are, and then that that is what underpins modern printing as well you know not just screen printing but the way that images are conveyed in a in a in a printed reality it is ultimately signal processing at the heart of it color is something that clearly inspires both of us you know i think we both go about it in a very systematic way you know i think about the prints that we make from the ground up you know it's not just reacting to things as we've said we have done but there's a real systematic way of getting things to look really bold and really really strong and i'm sure we can dive into the nitty-gritty but what is it about color and color spaces and color theory that excites you the most? Yeah, I'm pretty fascinated by color. It's really this subject that is kind of elusive where you think you know it and then you dive into it and you realize you don't know it at all. And it's also it's a subject that you learn as a kid. Like, you know, we all know like blue and red and things like that. And it's kind of this primary subject that everybody knows color. But it's also this subject that is incredibly dense and deep and like mathematical and scientific. And it's just fascinating to go down this rabbit hole. So actually, it was in uh, around COVID that I started really going into color quite a bit. I had a lot of time on my hands. I couldn't really leave the house. And so I thought I'm going to just start reading some papers on colorimetry and color science, color theory and things like that. And I realized I don't know anything about it. And with so it became, became this kind of study over the course of the last couple of years of just how can I learn about color and how can I learn about it in a way that it can shape my code and shape my generative systems. And so a lot of the tests and studies and attempts that I was working with was how can I create code that produces a nice color palette? How can I you know find combinations of color that are harmonious, but through this procedural lens? Or how can I, you know, even if I have hundreds of palettes that are pre-picked, how can I choose them in such a way that the contrasts line up? And so even things like color contrast became this rabbit hole that I went down. There's different types of color contrast algorithms to choose from. So it's this kind of study that has been continual in the last couple of years. And it seems like this kind of primary basic element of all artwork, but it's also something that I think a lot of artists don't really, you know, like to rip the the hood off and sort of expose the inner workings of, and quite often it's more just presented as, you know, here's the colors I chose rather than how do colors interact with each other, how does color perception change in different situations and things like that. So it's been, yeah, it's been really fun and really exciting to to look into color like this. Yeah, I think color is one of those subjects that's incredibly humbling. I think if anyone tells you that they really understand color and exactly how it works, you know, they're lying. <laughs> because I've done it for 12, 13 years, and you know, I've worked in this industry, printed for so many people, and every 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 week there's just some new color combination that I look at and think, oh, that's really interesting, or concepts, like you were saying about color contrast, you know, you know, you can really describe color in three ways. It has its hue, you know, the, its color, its value. You know, if you look at it in all colors in black and white, suddenly if you could see in black and white, how close are they to in this, in this kind of spectral origin how cl what, what kind of gray value are they? Um, and then you've got their saturation, which is essentially how close they are to their spectral origin. You know, if you split every color through a prism, yellow at its most saturated, if you saw it in black and white, would be kind of almost white. And then blue in its most saturated form would be almost gray. You know, there are so many crazy things that you can do with color. You know, it's a really fascinating way. And I think I found personally working with color is about building a language around it. I found myself, um, really struggling for some time in my life to explain color. You know, actually I couldn't really, I said tone or value or hue or saturate, you know, I don't really know what they meant, but like I said, every year it will humble you and you can figure out something new. And 
you know, I, I think they like said interesting color combinations. I think Van Gogh is a great example in the night sky. You think people think, well, what's that yellow he's used and that blue, they're so strong. The reason they're so strong is because the yellow and blue are opposite on the color wheel and the cones and rods in your eyes are just so excited and they can't really figure out what they're trying to do, you know, and, and that's why it looks so intense. And I don't think he really knew that, but I think he probably did in a subjective way. And, you know, you can distill it down and you can measure it, you know, reflected light with it. We have a spectrophotometer that we use to profile the different media, because if we digitally print on metal or plastic or paper, it will look very, very different, you know. Um, but inherently when we're making works for a lot of the artists that we do print for, um, we can measure and weigh it and everything, but it really does come down to how you react to it and if it just looks good or not. And I think that is really what makes you an artist, you know, um, is that if you know it looks good, you know, that's how you curate your work. And I think uh, it's, it's a perfect mixture between science and art. That's what, for me, is so fascinating about color that, you know, it's such an endless story. Color spaces, you know, different color space. I mean, I don't know, people in pre-press that's still baffled by really how it works, you know, but when you understand that as a printer, you can really maximize what your inks and what your prints can do. And I'm sure it's the same thing with your code, right? It's all about the basics. It's all about the fundamentals. Um, color theory is one of those incredibly fascinating, you know, things, CMYK and RGB, what do they really mean? You know, um, we could, I'm sure we could talk for, for days about it. But... I mean, it is, it is something that, yeah, it really changed. Like the more you know about color, and the more you understand about its you know, critical components, the better you can apply that to your work, even in code. So one of the things that's been kind of coming as like a reckoning for a lot of generative artists in the last few years, and anyone really working with color on a digital display, uh, is things like perceptual or perceptually uniform color spaces. And this is something that I've been like kind of interested in is how can we use some of these new color spaces that have been you know, relatively new in the last couple of decades or a few decades, how can we use those in our digital systems so that when we're using a color picker, we're not just using HSL, we're not just using the standard stuff, but we're actually using one that is built for purpose, built to be perceptually uniform. To end, what is your favorite thing about this print? I think it's just the process. It's been just a lovely process of like, diving into the layers and the acetate and the CMYK. And in the end, it's, you know, it's more beautiful because of this process.